You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 78. I'm your host, Chris Webster, with my co-host, Paul Zimmerman. Today we discuss digital ethics, preservation of digital files, and big data. Let's get to it. Okay, welcome to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 78. Paul, how's it going? It's going pretty good, Chris. How are you doing? I'm not doing too bad. I'm... Uh, I'm tired, but recovering. And tired, but recovering. <laughs> I, uh, right now, we're recording this in the middle of April, and uh, and uh, I understand that you've been traveling a little bit. Is that why you're tired, but recovering? Uh, a little bit, yeah. So I was at the uh, the busiest conference that archaeologists have in this country, anyway, and possibly the world, uh, except for possibly like WAC, the World Archaeological Conference, which only happens every four years. I understand they get a pretty big contingent of people there. Mm-hmm. Um, However, uh, I was at the Society for American Archaeology Conference in Washington, D.C., and it was an incredibly busy conference as usual. There's so much going on at one time, so much that you want to see, so much you want to do. Um, and uh, it's, it's really, I, I want to I say hard to fit it all in. It's impossible to fit it all in the way that they structure their, uh, the sessions. Uh, it, for some reason, we, we can't all figure it out. There's, there's sessions that are similarly themed that are back to back that are not back to back they're concurrent they're like right on top of each other and so you actually have to make a choice to go to one or the other it's almost like they did the opposite of the track system that most conferences do where you know you can jump from here to here to here but there's a track like if you want to go on the digital archaeology track you're not going to have any overlapping sessions they're going to space them out to where you can actually do that but it's almost like they're like well, these are all digital archaeology. Let's put them all at 10 a.m. on Saturday <laughs> because that makes sense. <laughs> well, they're forcing you to get a broader perspective, not sit in your own bubble and uh, follow just the, uh, the, the the subfield, sub subfield that you're into. I know. You know what? That might actually be true. Uh, that's the only coherent argument I've made to why they do that. But uh, it's still it's still very irritating, and everybody comments on it. Like everybody comments on it, and luckily. Uh, we were commenting on that during the only session I was in, which was a forum, which if you haven't been to the SAs, you don't know what we're talking about. A forum is essentially X number of people sitting up front, basically discussing a topic. And then if there's time at the end, taking questions from the audience. And it's basically just a discussion kind of thing. There's no paper. There's usually no pre- prepared remarks. Sometimes the the people in the forum will, um, uh, will start off by saying a five, seven minute long thing about you know, their ideas on the topic, but then it's really just a discussion kind of thing, usually led by a moderator or two. So anyway, in mine was the president elect of the, and I, well, I don't know when he officially takes over, actually, I, I assume now, maybe after the meetings, um, but the president elect of the SAAs, which is Joe Watkins. And Joe Watkins is notable for two things in, well, he's notable for lots of things, but two major things that I can think of that listeners to this podcast might be aware of. First off, we interviewed him and his colleagues uh, that were on Time Team America edition about probably three or four years ago, I think, on the mm-hmm. CRM Archaeology podcast. Yeah. So that's when I first talked to Joe. And also, Joe is the only the second Native American to ever hold the post of president of the SAAs, and the last one was 83 years ago. So, wow. yeah, it's pretty pretty notable, and I'm, I'm excited to hear some uh, uh, some what he's going to do in that position. You know what I mean? So. Mm-hmm. Um, another notable thing that happened for fans of archaeology is Toby Brimasek, the current executive director of the SA. Uh, now, there's a president, but the executive director, she really runs a show. <laughs> I mean, she she has her hand in everything, and she's been executive director of the SAAs for 22 years, and she's retiring this year. So I would imagine some major changes are going to be coming to the SAAs because, you know, an ED has a certain way they want to run things, and a change in ED in any organization is really a change in in how some of that organization operates, regardless what it is. So, you know, there's, there's probably going to be whoever brings in the, whoever gets the job next is going to, is going to probably put their own spin on it. And, uh, and we're all going to feel it good or bad. So, okay. Well, what we're talking about today, uh, as the title and introduction alluded to is that session that I was in on Sunday morning where Joe was in there and we were complaining about sessions being concurrent. So maybe he heard that, <laughs> but, uh, um, it, the session was called Virtual and Digital Ethics, um, Issues in Virtual and Digital Ethics. And there is a committee at the, or a task force, I think, in, in the SA meant to deal with this sort of thing. And uh, I'll, I'll give my, my quick spiel on, on what basically how I perceived that topic and, and what I think we need to do to, to 
I guess, adhere to the digital, the, the ethics of the, the ethical principles of the SA. And I don't have it in front of me, but I think there's like 12 ethical principles that they list out. So I mentioned a couple things. One, that I've been working in digital collection of data for um, at least 10 years uh, since I you know, got my first iPad, really right when I got into archaeology is, is when I really started thinking about it. Um, so maybe a couple of years after I got into archaeology. Anyway, I've been working on uh, on that stuff for a long time. And it's not just for efficiency's sake. It's not just for saving money because I'm a CRM. There are a lot of knock-on effects to digital collection of data. And I was stating that it's ethically responsible for us to do so because it, allow us, it allows us to save more data and more types of data in an unrestricted way. And what I mean by that is when we record stuff on paper forms, we often can't think outside the form. We, we look at these blocks we have to fill in, and it's difficult for us to think outside that because we have a certain restricted time frame, and we want to fill in these blocks and then move on. When we record data digitally, we can do it quicker, we can record more data, and we can add more things that aren't necessarily part of the paper form if it's appropriate for the project. I've done that before where I added more pieces of data that we just wanted to collect to have because it was there, but it wasn't required by the state for us to collect those data. Um, but it was super easy to do so in a digital format. So it's not just for efficiency, it's for um, you know more ethical data collection. And then on the top of that, uh, more long-term use of the data. And, and what I mean by that is if a grad student in 20 years wants to go back and look at a project from 10 years ago, and it's all PDF site forms, they're going to have hours and hours and hours of work to do just to make just to make that information actual data so then they can do some analysis on it. Whereas if they take one of my projects from the last five years, they'll have the CD that contains the raw data and they can just instantly do analysis on it. Um, they can search for things. They can do some sort of aggregate analysis, whatever they want to do. Uh, they can they can do that immediately. So that's good there. Uh, the other thing I pointed out in uh, virtual and digital ethics was uh, the Archaeology Podcast Network and how, you know, my main goal for this network, for having a network with so many different shows and different perspectives is to have an educational resource for people around the world. And that satisfies principle six of the vert of the ethics principles of the SAAs, which is basically public outreach. Um, it says right in the principles that archaeologists should present their work to the public in one way or another. And there are lots of ways you can do that. And a podcast is just one of those ways where you can get the information out about what you're doing, your project, whatever, uh, in a different way that people want to listen to. In a growing way that that a lot of people are listening to. There's millions of more user listeners uh, practically every month that you see the statistics come out and and everybody's listening to that. So uh, I think that's, that's, that's what I said during the thing. Um, but uh, before we go on to where the conversation really ended up taking off for like the last hour after everybody got to speak initially, uh, Paul, if you were in this forum on virtual and digital ethics as archaeologists and members uh, of the SAA, uh, I'm just going to throw this to you with zero preparation. Uh, <laughs> what, <is> that, <laughs> what does that mean to you without really, you know, kind of thinking about it for too long? What does that mean to you? Without thinking too hard and too long on it, the first thing that I think, obviously, is virtual and di- digital ethics. I'm like, first thought is, well, what? Secondly, it's, well, that sounds like a huge, wide-ranging topic that could go a lot of different directions. <laughs> Third thought is, that's not a bad thing because, um, you know, a lot of the computer technologies we have are so easy to invent and deploy and modify and change that, that a lot of times we do things with digital technologies just because we can. Um, and I think that especially uh, archaeologists who have uh, a role to science and to the public, or at least aspire to have these roles, um, it's really good for us to stop and take a look at exactly why and how we're doing things Uh to consider them thoughtfully, to understand them, to make sure that they're purposeful and helpful and meaningful in ways that uh, beyond just the the whiz bang of, yes, here's what I can do, here's what I can collect. So, yeah, wide ranging, big, but then, you know, as you and I were discussing a little bit beforehand, when it gets down to nuts and bolts, there are a few very discreet kinds of uh Topics that we deal with quite frequently, and uh, you touched on the uh, on public outreach, um, publication, uh, accessibility of the data that we do collect, dissemination of it, preservation of it. Those kinds of things, I think, really have to be brought to bear. And uh, regardless of the project, whether it's a CRM project, academic project, uh, how it's done, 
we need to consider these things. I think it's our ethical responsibility as researchers to, to consider these early on in our project, uh, in our project design, and then also, you know, revisit and rethink as we go to make sure that we're doing things in, uh, in a proper ethical or what we can argue is a proper ethical um, methods, standards, and so on. Right. Um, yeah. So I didn't really answer the question, did I? <laughs> but the, again, it's, well, it's you so, did. so broad ranging. Um, do we want to like, did, what, well, you were there. So I, did this conversation at this session, did it go in a particular direction more than any other direction? You know, kind of. Um, but to touch on, and, and I'll talk about that in a second, uh, to kind of touch on what you just said, though. It's actually, I wish I had thought of this while we were in the while we were in the session, or I wish you were there. <laughs> so you I wish I was that, there. But, I know, right? Um, but one thing you said was, you know, you were talking about. It, it sounded like to me that you were re- really just talking about ethical responsibility as an archaeologist to begin with. It strikes me as odd after hearing your comments and now reflecting on on what was said Sunday morning. Is why do we have the distinction between virtual and digital ethics and regular ethics mm-hmm. as a, as an archaeologist? It's like if you're following the ethical principles as an archaeologist, you will have good digital and virtual ethics, whatever that means to you for your projects. Um, and, and and the fact that we're talking about that now, when you know we've always ever since we started using computers in archaeology, we should have had a virtual and digital ethics question, right? Um, but we haven't. Uh, it's really quite quite recent, but honestly, it could have been happening in the last forty years. You know, I'm looking here at the uh, the principles uh, on the uh, SAA's website. You know, it's spelled out yeah. very clearly, very simple. Um, we ought to put a link in the sh- in the show notes here, but you could just right. run down this list. Number one, stewardship. Two, accountability. Three, commercialization. Four, public outreach or public education and outreach. And down the list, each one of these, you could think. You know, it doesn't take any effort to to come up with two or three questions that relate to the use of computers, the use of digital technologies uh, that touches upon these very same principles. So, I, yeah, I don't know that there's a, a meaningful distinction anymore to be made in our field between ethics and virtual and digital ethics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the only thing people need to think about, and this is this is where I'll, I'll talk about what other people were saying, uh, it, it really it really seemed like the people who were talking in the forum who were, who were, you know, invited there as speakers when they gave their initial comments, it really seemed that they were trying to say something about, you know, when you're collecting these data, like one guy was collecting LIDAR data down in, um, I'll get it wrong somewhere central or South America. And, uh, I think it was Maya somewhere Mayan. Um, anyway, he was collecting LIDAR data and he was making sure that, you know, what they were doing was in line with, you know, governmental regulations and cultural, cultural, you know, norms of the people there. Other people talking about recording, you know, audio and video information and, and other data. And, and again, they're talking, it, it seems like we just want to make sure that when we have forums like this, it seems to me like the reason is we want to make sure people are, are actually applying the ethical principles because they might think, that this is outside of the norm of what you do as an archaeologist. It doesn't involve a shovel or a trowel. Therefore, maybe it's outside of also my ethical principles, but in reality, it's not. Mm-hmm. And and that's what that's what you were saying too. Is um, you know, if we just follow the normal ethical principles, then then we don't need to have this conversation at all. We just make sure those are tight, and that everything we do related to a project follows those, whether we're creating a virtual reality simulation or uh, writing up our site report. It doesn't matter. Well, let's so. you know, are we? Uh have we just transferred our paper files onto the tablet and we're basically filling out paper on glass? Have we just transferred our ethical (laughs) responsibilities uh, to the computer and digital world or no, it's, it's integral. It's uh, we have to think of it more holistically. It can't be separated. That said though, um, because we have such, you know, such new tools at our disposal now and with increasing ubiquity, it, uh, it really does highlight how we have to, to be very mindful of, um, of our ethical obligations instead of just running off half cocked and photographing, scanning, disseminating everything in every way possible just because we can. Okay. Well, for the, for the remainder of this show, uh, more than likely, unless it goes somewhere else, uh, <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about something that, uh, this came up really early on in people's comments um, during the uh, 
during the forum. And then it became almost a focus of discussion for the rest of the forum. And there was so much I wanted to say about this, but it, there was a question posed to me probably because I went first. Uh, they asked for volunteers. And I'm like, well, I'm getting this out of the way right away. So I went up first and gave my spiel. And there was a question posed to me and then posed throughout after that, the question of curation in perpetuity of digital information. That's a good and one. what that means is, yeah, what that means is basically uh, the woman who asked the question, she runs a museum in Arizona. And she was talking about the physical collections and, you know, the physical collections can sit in boxes for decades, if not centuries, uh, with little to no maintenance is kind of what's kind of her point. You just throw it in there, you set it, you forget it, you make sure the place stays clean and you're done. Uh, the paper records, again, not a whole lot of, of work needs to be done to that. Obviously, uh, she was talking about how they can still read site reports from, from 50 years ago. And obviously there is some maintenance that has to be done to paper records, uh, I mean, maybe less so in, uh, or maybe more so in Arizona where it's so dry there. Um, I don't know what kind of <laughs> environmental conditions their curation facility has, but if it's paper records, chances are it's a file cabinet in a room somewhere and not actually inside the curation area. That's what I've seen mostly with paper records. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, those are going to be a problem uh, maybe in another 50 years. I don't know. It depends on the paper. Uh, but that being said, um, you know, her question was basically they have a whole bunch of digital information and here I'll start this off, Paul, by, and get your thoughts on this. So she had two initial problems. One is file formats. Obviously, she said they have file formats from 15 years ago that are no longer readable, and there's just nothing they can do about it. Um, possibly maybe there is, and they're just not aware of it. I'm not really sure. I'm sure somebody, if it's only 15 years ago, I'm pretty sure you could probably find an old copy of a piece of software somewhere and get it to run on something. Maybe, maybe not. I don't really know. But anyway, so there was that question. And then the other thing was the amount of data that they get. So she said when when people get were submitting site reports and things like that uh, in paper, it's it's really very limited. You get the site records, you get maybe a curated selection of the photos. They're not going to submit everything because it's expensive. Um, they'll give you you know the the choice photos from what they took, uh, and then they'll give you some other stuff. Well, now people are taking thousands of photos because they're cheap to the to the make to the archaeologist to, to produce those they just throw them on a cd or something and they hand them to them so the the sheer volume of data that they're getting in just the number of terabytes and petabytes of data that they have to store has dramatically increased and because of that they're having a, a little bit of a freak out about what they're going to do with all this stuff and and what they're going to do with it so uh, we're going to go to break in a second and i'll get your thoughts after the break paul but so the two big questions are old file formats. How do you create data that that is persistent? And then also the volume of data. How do we deal with that? So file formats and big data are the two big major questions out of that. Yeah, those are uh, huge topics, each of them in their own right. So uh, I'm sure we've got plenty to talk about here without touching on a lot of the other <laughs> potential topics that uh, fall under this big umbrella of uh, digital and vir- virtual ethics. Exactly. So, all right. Well, we'll do that right on the other side of the break. Back in a second. Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, British Columbia, has launched a professional online master's program built by and for cultural heritage management practitioners. The thesis-based MA or coursework-only graduate certificate both offer integrated study of HRM's ethical, legal, business, and research priorities. The MA thesis requirements comply with registered professional archaeologists and other jurisdictional standards. This is the perfect graduate program for bachelor-level CRM practitioners ready to make a career commitment, but not ready to relocate or quit their job. We have advertised for SFU in the past, and we had a long podcast about SFU's program, and I highly recommend it. If you're looking to get a graduate degree in cultural resource management, this is the way to go. Apply today at www.sfu.ca forward slash archaeology. That's www.sfu.ca forward slash archaeology to take your career to new levels today. Hey, podcast fans and digital archaeologists. Have you heard about WildNote? It's a data collection app that works online or offline on your smartphone or tablet, iOS or Android. It allows you to collect field data easily, manage data efficiently, and generate data reports and site records effortlessly. We have a growing list of state site forms built in for your use and some generic forms that will work anywhere. Check out the shovel testing and photograph forms. You can get a free all-access 30-day trial today by going to wildnoteapp.com. That's wildnoteapp.com for your free 30-day trial. Now back to the show.
All right, we're back on Archaeotech episode 78, and we are talking about the Virtual and Digital Ethics Forum at the 2018 SAA conference in Washington, D.C. That was just a week ago, as uh, a few days ago, as we're talking, as we're recording this. And so we, we left off with two big questions that came out of that. And one of those was file formats, preservable file formats, stuff that's readily available as far into the future as we can possibly see. Um, so, and we've already kind of talked about this, but Paul, what are your initial thoughts on this um, regarding file formats? My initial thoughts are I could talk about this all day and bore everybody to tears, but I'm glad that this came up in uh, in this particular session because being able to have data, documents, reports, what we produce as archaeologists, the knowledge that we've gained uh, so that other people in the future, hopefully a long ways in the future, uh, can look at it and, uh, and learn from it uh, is very important. I think that's part of our ethical responsibility is – keeping our data accessible for other people. Um, the example you had was about uh, about old paper, uh, paper reports being accessible. Well, yes, but, uh, you know, I used to get, to get, I work at a school, I used to get this complaint a long time, uh, you know, when I first started working here, 17 years ago, I used to get this all the time from the, uh, from some of the English teachers. Like, how come I have to upgrade my computer? You know, it's only five years old. <laughs> I have books right. that are 150 years old on my shelf. Yeah, well, they're different things. They do different things. But um, but one has to adapt, you know? And so we can't just have a file, a computer file from 15 years ago and, you know, ignore it and hope that somebody is going to be able to open it up later. I mean, if you have a text file, maybe you're okay. If you have a database file, probably not. If you have a spreadsheet, meh, who knows? Um Images, yeah, they're probably okay, but you have to have an understanding of the different files and the different file formats and how you're going to preserve them, how you're going to file them, how you're going to catalog them, what physical media you're going to hold them on. Uh, that's very important too. Um, maybe yeah. we'll talk to that a little bit because that touches on our next topic: the uh, the sheer volume of data. You know, you're you have um, there, there are two basic takes on uh, on how to be responsible about one's file format. What you're telling me is what you think is uh, collect your data, write your files, do it in whatever format you like, but then once you're done with them, make sure that they get saved to another format that other people can use. And that's a perfectly valid, uh, that's a perfectly valid way of going about it. So for example, you write your, uh, your report in whatever word processor you like best and then export it in maybe word format, uh, probably um, an RTF, maybe text, definitely a PDF. Um, mm -hmm. you, you put it on a format. And I like PDFs. I'm just going to comment on that briefly. Um, PDF is an open standard. I mean, it's not something that everybody can muck with and change the standards to their own liking. Uh, Adobe keeps a pretty tight wraps on that. But how the files are encoded is an open standard. And that means that other people will be able to access that standard and open up PDFs, hopefully far into the future. Um, so when I was writing my dissertation, that's 10 years ago now, uh, I, in my tech in archaeology chapter, I said, you know, save things as PDFs. I was getting way too many Word documents. And, you know, I, I've been on Mac since... Oh, <laughs> since high school, since 87. <laughs> um, and, you know, I get a Word document that was made on Windows. And I open it up on my Mac and the fonts are slightly different. You know, they've got a font called Times. I've got a font called Times, but they're different specs. And suddenly all the pagination is off. Well, that's a problem. You don't get that problem with the PDF. So the PDFs are a nice way of preserving things that have to be formatted in a particular way, uh, hopefully fairly far onto the future. The other way of dealing with file formats than what I just described, uh, and I hope I didn't butcher your opinion too badly there, um, <laughs> is to actually start in a format that's fairly open and accessible. You know, right. so if you're writing things like RTF, just write straight into an RTF editor, um, text, I'm actually a really big fan of writing documents either in something like Markdown, which is a very simplified um, markup language for, for, especially for HTML output, but it works for a number of different things. Uh, and also my personal favorite is LaTeX, 
which has been around for a long, long time and isn't controlled by anybody in particular and is very open source and has a great user community and produces beautiful uh, print ready output at the end and PDFs and things. So, um, so my take on it is I tend to wherever possible, not use a proprietary software for generating my files. I keep the, the whole chain beginning to end, uh, as much as possible with, um, with various open tools. I don't think that one's better than the other, frankly, I, it's just my preference. The important thing, I think this is where we, we absolutely do agree, is that that final output has to be something that 5, 10, 15 years from now, 15 years was the, uh, was the, the cutoff there that was just made on the, that you, the example that you'd given about those files from Arizona. 20 years or more into the future, somebody will still be able to read. Now that works, you know, right now we're talking about, I've been talking about mostly word processing kinds of documents, things for the reports. It becomes a much stickier situation when we talk about things like, uh, like data, right? Mm -hmm. Especially databases. Uh, There are, you know, if you have your database tables and you have them documented and you've got a well-structured database, you should be able to output things to like a CSV file, which is text and it's platform independent and it's easily, it's fairly easily human read and it can be used to reconstruct your database. You could also output, if you have a, an SQL database of whatever kind, uh, you can also output the raw SQL with all the insert statements. Um, and that should be something that somebody 50 years from now should be able to reconstruct your database in its entirety from with very little uh, extra work trying to massage it because SQL is a language that's been used since the 70s. Um, Again, one has to think about these things beforehand and make sure that the uh, that the data files that you're producing are, you know, if you want your own specific kind, great, but make sure that you make another copy that's going to be at least one other copy that's going to be in some other format that's more open, more accessible, um, not tied to one particular piece of software, because that's where we get into troubles when things are tied to one particular piece of software, because as we all know, the uh, the software game is really really fast, mm-hmm. and programs move quickly. And before long, your version one program is version three, and it's having troubles with properly opening the version one files that you made, you know, five six years ago. And by the time it hits version five, it can't do anything with those, and your data, your reports, whatever you have, are locked out unless you have an old computer that can run the older software. And then that company gets bought out by another company and the product gets folded into something else and then you're totally lost. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) And I say that because I've seen it all. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. And let me, let me comment a few things on here before we move on. Um, because Paul said everything right. And, and I just wanted to bring up a couple things related to what you were saying. PDFs, uh, I've heard, I've actually heard people say that, oh, I don't like PDFs because who knows if, you know, they're going to be around in a while. But PDF was, sure, developed by Adobe. However, uh, it was developed 24 years ago in 1993. I just looked this up. And in 2008, I think it was, it was made in ISO 32000-2 standard, which means it's Mm -hmm. never going to change. Um, You know, the government had decided this is something that we're going to maintain in perpetuity. The only thing I would caution you on is um, I'm in the Civil Air Patrol. And for some reason, everybody at the, the wing level, the next level up for my squadron, they like to send all their PDF documents down using, actually using Adobe Acrobat Pro. And they have these ridiculous um, standards put on the PDFs to where that if you don't have Pro, you actually can't open it. Or if you don't have Acrobat Reader, you can't open it. If you're trying to open it with some other PDF reader, like on a Mac, everybody has Preview, and I open most of my PDFs in Preview, but my PDFs that are PDFs that are made in Acrobat Pro will not open in preview. And that can be an issue. The data is still there. Somebody else could get to it. If you if, if Acrobat fell off the planet and that program disappeared, you can still get to it. It's a little more difficult, but because of the, the file standard. Um, but that being said, this is a 24-year-old file format and there's little chance of it going anywhere. Um, a comment about CSV files. Uh, they're newer than I expected. They were um, actually first kind of played around with in 2005. Um, and it's not a standard data format. Um, CSV just means comma separated values. And really that's just referring to the way that the data are organized within this file. And honestly, what that means is you have all your values separated by commas and there's other things that can denote line breaks and things like that. 
And basically you put that file into something that says, okay, every time I hit a comma, I'm going to make a new column or I'm going to go to the next line or something like that. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because like Paul said, you know, record your data in whatever you want to do it in, whatever you're comfortable with. If you're a Microsoft Word person, great. Use Microsoft Word. If you're Pages for Mac, great. Use Pages um, to do all your documents and whatever you're going to do. I do audio stuff in Adobe Audition. I record in WAV files. That's all fine. If you're a GarageBand user, you're going to get a .band file. But when it comes time to finish up the project and finalize and then put this somewhere in perpetuity for someone else to use it, export those file formats into something that's going to be more human readable. And I've got a project I did three years ago. I talk about it all the time. We had over 250 sites recorded. And the output from the data gathering tool I was using is a CSV file. And I would take that CSV file and make my Word documents out of that and then modify those documents and then create PDFs. So I have three basic formats for every single one of my site data. I have the PDF of the site record. I have the Word document that was created. And I have a master CSV file that's maybe 500 kilobytes that contains all the site data for 250 sites. And that is the that is the meat of the whole thing right there. That is the database that somebody can take that that CSV file and basically drop that into any database and say, let's do magic on this right now. You can't do that with the Word document. You can't do that with the PDFs. Um, so there's three different formats that I saved all that stuff in that uh, that the client now has and that hopefully they sent off to the information center when they, when they submitted the report <laughs> or the Navy <laughs> base. Hopefully they included all that. I gave it all to them, but hopefully they included that stuff. But the whole point is, like Paul said, use what you want, but make sure the final step is just, we always do something curation wise to artifacts, to paper documents, to whatever. You just got to do the same thing to your data. It's just that extra step that we do right at the very end that saves it in the most persistent, if not human readable um, format that you can find and make sure you send it off to a facility that, I mean, this is a tall order, but hopefully the facility has a way to um, know what standards you have and then have a standard checking cycle that basically says, hey, every five years, we're going to look and make sure that this file format is still accessible by us and, you know, what's going on here. Or somebody that requires certain file formats and then stays on top of that. If, if something goes down or is going to go away, they've got somebody at the facility that says, okay, well, we know that this data standard is going away and it's not going to be readable anymore. So we need to convert everything over to this now and, and start using this. It's just maintenance. That's all it is. So, well, I'm going to just uh, mention this and I know this is going longer than we'd intended, but uh, again, I think it's, it's, it's a critically important topic. Uh, mm-hmm. Standards, you use that term a couple of times and that's what these things are. CSV is a standard. It's, it's kind of a loosey goosey one, but it's, it's pretty much human readable. People can understand it. Yeah. Um, PDF is a standard standard, you know, it's documented <laughs> and that documentation of how these files are put together is really, really important. So, so it doesn't belong to one company. Uh, so it doesn't belong to one piece of software. So it doesn't want belong in one person's head. If you're making your own file system, or your, not file system, your own file format um, for your own data collection, document it. Make sure that the uh, that the format itself is documented so that other people can see it and understand it. Because uh, for people above, you know, older than twenty, twenty five, maybe what they forget is that the initial wave of the uh, of the World Wide Web the standards weren't particularly codified and there was a big fight, especially between Netscape and, um, and Microsoft about defining what made HTML, what made the very basic markup. Uh, and so we ended up having, you know, any website you'd go to, it'd say, if use best in IE5, you know, use uh, Firefox to, to see this best or Mozilla back then, I guess. Mm-hmm. Everybody realized pretty quickly that what happened was that there was this mess of if you want to use the web, you had to have this plugin, you had to have that browser. Otherwise, you know, you wouldn't be able to see things right. And so the, uh, the browser companies and the, uh, the major content providers all actually got together and hashed out, not, not happily, but they, 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 they recognized that they had to and hashed out standards. And for the most part now adhere to these standards. You know, there are certain things like right now we're recording on Zencaster and it works best in, uh, in Chrome, you know, so they're, they're edge cases, but the importance of standards is, uh, is, 
can't be overstated. And for those of us that saw the first wave of the uh, the rush onto the World Wide Web, it's it's something that we should know from personal experience because we saw it not too long ago. Yeah, and that, that's kind of a good um, kind of a, a good segue somewhat into the final topic for the day, uh, which is really big data. Uh, you know, once you've figured out how to save all your data, now what the hell do you do with it? Um, because one thing this person was talking about at the forum who runs a museum is that they're getting massive amounts of digital data in now. Whereas when it was paper data, it was, you know, if you'd scanned all that stuff in and converted it to digital, the volume they're getting is quite less because, you know, people had to either mail this stuff in or produce it or print it or whatever. And there's certain costs associated with that. But now that the cost is virtually nothing for archaeologists to produce an almost an unlimited stream of photographs and, you know, uh, 3D reconstructions and, you know, all kinds of stuff, uh, the cost is uh, almost nothing compared to <laughs> what it would be with paper. So people are turning in just volumes and volumes of digital data and they don't know how to store all this stuff. They don't know how to tend to it. So um, that's the last thing I wanted to mention is that if you are... Uh, sending your stuff to a curatorial facility or you are a curatorial facility or you're a museum or whatever the case may be, you have to you have to look at ways to store your data and to maintain your data in the same way that you do your physical collections. And that might be different for different organizations depending on their size. One thing I will mention just to get it in before we run out of time is the concept of RAID, redundant array of independent disks. That's going to be uh, an incredibly important thing. And you hear about these server farms that like Google and Facebook and Apple, and they all have all these guys that are dealing with big data. These survey farms are basically just huge RAID storage devices. It's basically your data 700 times across this facility. So if one disk dies, it's not gone. It's still there. And there's a complicated computer system that says, I know where each one of these bits are. And I'm going to store a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here. And when I need to put it all back together, I will. And if any one piece of that dies, or hell, even if a whole section of the building collapses, probably, you're unlikely to lose really any data uh, because they're really concerned with that. And where I'm going with this is we don't need to reinvent the wheel when it comes to figuring out how to store and maintain all these data. People are already doing it and they have been doing it for decades now. And uh, I mean, Google is what, 20 years old at least? Um, You know, they've been storing big data. It might be your data and that's another conversation, but they've been storing big data for (laughs) a really long time uh, with little to no degradation. and, And quite honestly, despite all the hacking stuff we hear about, really quite secure. Um, it's unlikely that you've ever known anybody that that got really seriously hacked, not like credit card numbers and stuff like that, but like really seriously got into your stuff and really pulled your things off of like a cloud server kind of thing. Um, it's just not as prevalent as, as the media would like to make you think it is. The point is, let's let's talk to these people. Let's have a conversation and figure out how they're doing it and then how we can use that ourselves um, and, and go down that line. So. I don't know. There's a lot more we could get into on this, Paul. Do you have any, do you have any big final thoughts on big data? Uh, big data. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I actually, I have one that's probably not the most helpful observation, but I do, uh, we talk about big data uh, and we mean a lot of data for a single person to interpret, you know, a lot of archaeological data, a lot of site records, a lot of, uh, a lot of object records, a lot of photographs, a lot of drawings, a lot of all the stuff that we as archaeologists do. Uh, that's a slightly different take than, big data in the Google Facebook sense. Mm -hmm. Um, And some of their methods, certainly their storage methods, I think are really handy for us to take advantage of, learn from, or just outright use them, you know, store your stuff in Amazon's, uh, in Amazon's cloud instead of on your own servers. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because you get the advantages of the redundancy that you were just describing. Um, And that, that, goes a long way towards data preservation, which is an ethical responsibility of archaeologists. Uh, But when it comes to the data analysis, which is the other thing that people think about with big data, um, for the most part, I have not seen archaeological kinds of data that really are especially amenable to the tools of the Google, Facebook, Amazon big data sense. Um, I'm probably wrong on that. (laughs) <laughs> but uh, but it seems that we're working with which with data sets that uh, are both smaller than what their their big tools are for and also more discrete. That is, you know, we're looking for particular kinds of data 
uh, related to very discrete entities rather than, you know, Facebook, which is trying to get behavioral patterns on millions of people at once by aggregating all sorts of things that they've done. Um, I think the scale does affect the kinds of tools that they have versus the kinds of tools that we need. Um, but that's a, that's a whole different discussion too. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Uh, but amount of data as far as storage goes is always relevant, I think, to archaeologists. Um, do we have a third section coming up? Uh, yeah. So let me jump into that after the break. I have a comment to make relative to what you just said. We're going to have a shorter third section coming right up, uh, and then I'm going to add some other stuff in the end of this. So um, let's go ahead and do that real quick because we're already going long on this, and we'll be back in just a second. All right. This network is supported by our listeners. You can become a supporting member by going to arcpodnet.com slash members and signing up. As a supporting member, you have access to high quality downloads of each show and a discount at our online store and access to show hosts on a members only Slack team. For professional members, we'll have training shows and other special content offered throughout the year. Once again, go to arcpodnet.com slash members to support the network and get some great extras and swag in the process. That's arcpodnet.com slash members. Are you tired of the webinars and training offered by the big organizations not being free for members and not really covering what we need? Team Black has the answers. Check out arcsert.black forward slash main for our upcoming webinar schedule. All of our webinars happen once a month and seating is limited. Learn everything from field tech basics to drones to digital workflows. We have more classes coming online every month. Classes are always one hour and cost just $20. Classes like building a CV and getting a job are always free. That's right. We'll help you get a job, then we'll be here when you want to level up your skills. If you are a professional subscriber to the APN at arcpodnet.com slash members, then you get all of Team Black's offerings for free as part of your membership. We have Team Black memberships coming that will give the same for the APN. So $20 a month gets you all the APN swag and extras plus free training from Team Black. So check out arccert.black for more information and level up your skill set today. That's arccert.black. Now back to the show. Okay, we're back with episode 78. And uh, Paul, we're wrapping up our thoughts on big data. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah. So what we're dealing with here, we were discussing the, uh, you know, you said the people curating this data are being overwhelmed by the amount of data that we as archaeologists are producing. And I can certainly understand that. So what I want to just introduce is the thought that uh, we as archaeologists have to curate the data that we hand over to the curators. I, I don't mean give them a selected bit like we would in the old publishing day, paper publishing days, uh, but I mean, index it. Uh, highlight what we think is important, give, give them some sort of a hook uh, so that when they have the data and they're storing it for future archaeologists to look at, the public to look at, educators to look at, themselves to look at, whatever, um, they have some sense of what we as the collectors of the data initially thought were the important bits of it. Now, oftentimes we'll do that in the report itself, but you may want to provide an overall uh, index or uh, an index of the highlights. Yeah. You know, the curation doesn't have to start and end with the curator. And that's certainly something that we as trained professionals, you know, we know what we think is important about what we found. Why shouldn't that be part of uh, what we hand over? You know, that that kind of first level interpretation of, hey, th this stuff is interesting. This collection of things are interesting. The site is interesting. Uh, this question that I had looking at these things is interesting. And that can be part of the record as well. Yeah, that's an incredibly important point that I don't think a lot of people think about. Uh, you know, we just hand over volumes of data and say, here you go, deal with it. <laughs> yeah, data so, dump doesn't help people. No, it really doesn't. And that's what curation facilities are getting because they are they don't have standards for um, receiving those data. And the people sending it to them don't really understand really how or what to send them anyway, which is what we've been talking about. So, um, all right, well, I'll wrap up my comments with... Uh, uh, you know, again, I want to stress that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. We as archaeologists tend to want to do everything in-house, and usually that's a financial decision, but we're we're getting way beyond the point where, you know, uh, a financial decision 30 years ago was, oh, should I hire a lithics expert or should I just read all these books and learn about lithics and then I'll know, you know. Um, 
that was a financial decision that we made. And we tr- chose to do that in-house because it was a skill that we needed. Well, nowadays it's getting way more complicated. And I'll, I'll just use your car as an example. 20 years ago, you may have changed the oil on your car. Nowadays, you might not even know where the oil filter is on your Prius, right? So, you know, uh, or maybe you're driving an electric car and yeah, I, don't, I have no idea where the oil? Uh, oil filter is on the Tesla. <laughs> right? Like, I have no idea. I wouldn't even know where to look, you know? Um, I don't think there is one. <laughs> there might not be. I mean, they've got to lubricate something. I have no right? idea. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is a good point. And this is so. So let's let's figure out and find those people that already have the answers and, and do this. There's another thing that we've talked about on this on there on there. There's another digital data collection application out there, and I'm not going to name them here because I've done it plenty of times. But they have on their website for archaeologists by archaeologists, and that was actually on there a long time ago. And I was like, I always kind of had a little bit of a problem with that, which is, uh, you know, archaeologists are good at certain things. Archaeologists are good at being archaeologists. Archaeologists are not developers, typically. Archaeo- and now, people have developing skills, don't get me wrong. But if you're going to hire, say, somebody to do brain surgery on you, you're probably not going to hire the person that watched a bunch of YouTube videos and, and did some sideline side hustle work on doing brain surgery. You're going to find the best brain surgeon you can afford to do that. Okay. Now, not that storing your data is a is as important as brain surgery, but it kind of is because the data we're collecting is never going to be seen again. And if we don't work to really preserve the way that that is preserved for the future, then no one will ever see it again. Your 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 hard work, your effort, everything. Some and and more important than that, somebody's entire historical record is going to be lost because you didn't decide to save it as a CSV versus a docx file, and now nobody can read it. So. You know, that's we, that's a stupid mistake that we all have made and probably will continue to make for a while, but we need to stop making that. And um, I'll just end my thing here with a slight plug for one of my services that I have over at DigTech, and I'll, I'll link to this so you can see it. It's my concierge service, I call it. And concierge at a hotel will basically do anything for you. I mean, they'll go get you anything. They'll answer any question. And if they don't know the answer to the question, they'll find somebody that does. And that's what I do with my digital concierge service site. You basically put me on retainer for the year. It's one flat fee and I will answer all of your questions. Now, that doesn't mean I know all the answers to your questions, but I kind of keep plugged into this whole data and digital universe. And if I don't have the answer, there's a good chance that I'm only one or two degrees separated from the person that does know the answer and I will put you guys in touch. So don't try to figure this out yourself. It's not worth your time. Go analyze artifacts and come up with these fantastic interpretations, write books, but leave those big questions to somebody else that will save you a lot of money in the time in the time. So that's all I've got. Uh, we're going to do a fourth segment here. And the fourth segment is basically, we're not doing the app of the day segment. I'm including some really short interviews uh, that I took that are appropriate for this podcast. Um, interviews that I got at the society for American archaeology conference related to technology in archaeology. So we'll be back in a second and enjoy those interviews. Before I say that, Paul, thanks for coming on the show and with all your thoughts today. Thanks for having me, Chris. Very interesting. I wish I was uh, there to join you at the SAAs. Just couldn't make it down this year. I know. Well, Albu- Albuquerque next year. Maybe we'll maybe we'll get everybody down there. So, all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah we'll see. <laughs> <All right>. Wistfully. <laughs> I know. Right, right. So, all right. Well, thanks a lot, and uh, enjoy this next segment with all these short interviews. And we'll see you next time. Bye. Hey, podcast listeners, do you find yourself wondering what the latest tablet or smartphone could do for your business? Wonder what GPS to pair with your device? Just trying to figure out how to go digital in the field without breaking the bank and or making a bad investment? Or did you find a technology company to work with, but just aren't sure the questions you need to ask during the initial conversation? Well, you're not alone. There are literally thousands of tech combinations out there, and it can be really tough finding the right one for your business and your workflow. My name is Chris Webster, and I've been working in CRM since 2005, and I've been a tech enthusiast my entire life. I spend my time trying to figure out how to make archaeology more efficient, both technologically and financially. No one is going to give you a big pile of money to do whatever you want with, so you have to make the most of what you have. The right gear can mean the difference between zero margins on that next project and an employee benefits package. That's where DigTech Concierge comes in. Let us be your technology guru. Whether you have just a few questions or want us on retainer 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, we're here to help. With years of experience, tens of thousands of acres of survey done completely digitally, and many, many people trained, DigTech is your tech BFF just waiting to guide you through this process now and through the inevitable changes to come. Should you hold on to those tablets or upgrade? What about the new operating system? Will it crash your apps, or can you go ahead and do it? We know the answers and can guide you to a profitable year. 
go to www.digtech-llc.com slash tech-concierge to book a consultation or book us for the year. The yearly retainer includes unlimited calls and support and company training on software and gear. That's digtech-llc.com slash tech-concierge. And concierge is C-O-N-C-I-E-R-G-E. To get going and go digital today. Call us before you make any decisions. We've been there before. Hey, welcome back to the Archaeotech Podcast, episode 78. And as promised, here are a few clips that I recorded from the 2018 Society for American Archaeology annual meeting presentations. These are mostly from the exhibit hall and or poster sessions because those are the easiest places to record. They're a little noisy. The audio is a little bit all over the place, but I've done as much to clean them up as I possibly can. So sit back and enjoy this virtual presentation from the Society for American Archaeology conference. Thank you. All right, this is Chris Webster at the Society for American Archaeology Conference in Washington, D.C., and I'm with Haley Ferguson of Brigham Young University and her poster, Settlement Patterns and Predictive Modeling in... How do you... In Chihuahua, Mexico. Why did I not know how to pronounce that? All right, so tell me about your poster and and, uh, and how it started and what you guys did. Uh, so the, the point at the beginning was to create a geo database of all of the archaeological work that had been done for this area of northern Mexico. Um, and then beyond that, uh, I took the data and uh, did some geospatial analyses in order to uh, do a predictive model to show areas on the landscape that um, have a higher probability of having archaeological sites based on the relationships between the sites that I knew about and those environmental variables. Okay. All right, so you used existing data to do your predictive modeling, and then did you test what the model produced? That's the next step. <laughs> so I did test it on paper. Um, I withheld some of the sites and the non-site data that I had um, from the training data set in order to test it um, and had uh, 73% accuracy, um, which is good for this this type of analysis. Um, and so the next step will be to ground truth it and to zero in on some of those areas that are now high probabilities um, zones and to see see what we find there. Okay, and do you think this method could be used in, in obviously, other areas? You just pop in variables from someplace else and... And this could work somewhere else? Yeah, absolutely. Anywhere that you have geospatial data, um, it's just amassing all of that information into into one hole that takes the most time. But then the processing of it, um, yeah, you can do it anywhere. Yeah, that's, uh, I mean, I'm a CRM archaeologist, and that's, man, if we could just predict where everything was, we could we could budget better, and we could, <laughs> we could do everything. Absolutely. This is used, uh, in the States especially, this is used uh, yeah. a lot in CRM. Uh, to be cost, you know, cost efficient, time efficient, uh, to narrow down those areas where you're likely to find sites. Yeah, we do. We always do uh, non-scientific predictive modeling when we do a literature search. We're like, well, there's stuff in this valley and stuff in this valley, which means there must be stuff here where my project area is. Right. No, that those yeah. intuitive uh, assumptions, you know, they go into a lot um, of the predictive modeling. This is just a more quantitative way to illustrate that. Okay. Are there plans to do the, the ground truth thing, or is that just future hopeful research? I would love to get down there. <laughs> I would love to. It is part of the future research plan. Okay. No plans yet, but I would like to. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. This is Chris Webster at the SAA's 2018 Washington, D.C., and I'm with Eric Fries and his poster, Testing a Multimodal Remote Sensing Approach for Detecting Ancient Maya Sites with Low-Resolution Data. That is a long title. Tell me what it's all about. So the big deal in Maya archaeology right now is using LIDAR to find um, sites that are buried by the jungle. But uh, on my project, we don't have LIDAR. <laughs> and so I was looking for an alternative to that, um, preferably one that's a little cheaper. And what I came across was a method for using low-resolution data to get similar results, to detect sites that are covered by the jungle and hard to see um, on the ground. And so what we did was we took 30-meter resolution uh, Aster DEM, digital elevation model data, and Landsat data, and we did a variety of manipulations on those to get several different analytical layers. And then we took a series of test sites. One of the advantages of our project is that instead of working on one site, we have a large number of minor centers that are spread all over the landscape, so we have a lot of points to test this data against. And we found out which values in each of those analyses match up well with our um, known sites. Each of those values, those value ranges, was given a score of one, basically. And every other pixel in the raster was given a score of zero. And that gives us a score overlay for that raster. And then we added all those together to give us a final score. So every pixel on the map, every 30 meter block, has a score between zero and four that shows how well it correlates with the presence of known sites. 
then we took that raster and we threw it over the rest of our um, 150 kilometer, square kilometer project area. And we found a large number of hot spots in areas that we either thought had sites but we can't get into them for property access reasons or we thought had sites but we can't get in for they're too remote or too difficult to reach or we were able to confirm rumors or reports from other sources that there might be sites in this general area but no one really knows where and so of course I can't show you on the podcast uh, the 12 examples that I have here but basically we found numerous hot spots in areas that we either can get to or we think we can negotiate access to they have to be ground truthed and in one case already, we were able to ground truth it and found a site that exactly matches up to the four pixels on the map where it shows there should be sites in a large expanse of otherwise um, zero score. Great. So were you able to uh, put in uh, additional existing sites that you actually knew where they were to actually test your model uh, to see how it went? I think you may have mentioned that a little bit, but maybe explain that a little more. Like how many sites did you guys put in and, and then what kind of accuracy did it come out with? Sure. So we used, uh, our, test, our test set is four known sites that are not in our project that are well excavated and well surveyed, and then seven sites that are in our project that are mapped um, but mostly have not been excavated. And those are all monumental sites with a minimum size of 100 by 150 meters, so um, they show several pixels on the map. Correlation is pretty good, not perfect. What we basically were able to see is that if there's a hot spot in our data set, it matches up well with the central monumental area of the site. However, it's not usually exact, and the exactness um, varies a lot depending on the vegetation and the exact topographical position. So we do have a test set. We could get a better test set. Um, what would be really nice would be to actually get access to the LiDAR data and test it against that and see how well it matches. I don't know about the uh, the area. Have you looked at some of the somewhat cheaper drone LiDAR options that are out there these days? Yeah, that is something that I've looked into a little bit. Um, at the time this work was done, the, bu the project budget was zero dollars, <laughs> and so that was the maximum amount of money that could be spent. And this was done in QGIS using uh, data that's all available online from USGS, and so the cost was zero dollars. Nice. Um, but yeah, obviously I would like to refine this or spend more money in the future. Absolutely. Well, best of luck to you, and uh, looking forward to seeing what else comes out of this. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. This is Chris Webster at the Society for American Archaeology Conference 2018 in Washington, D.C., and I'm with Daniel Pierce with his poster, Seeing Red and Analysis of Archaeological Ochre in East Central Missouri. So, Daniel, uh, get us up to speed. What's the uh, initial thing you're trying to do here? Well, what I have is a group of archaeological uh, ochres. It's a red hematite, and we're, we found it in East Central Missouri, out by the city of St. Louis. We're trying to figure out where it was actually mined at, so where they were trading it from. Our, my results basically showed that we, we don't know exactly where it's from, but we can tell where it's not from. <laughs> well, that, that, that's usually pretty good, though. Um, and East Central Missouri, I mean, is that, uh, and you're St. Louis, that sounds like Cahokia, if somebody were to explain that to me. How, how is that associated with that at all um well actually that area was it was part of the kind of cahokia complex at one time so some of some of this uh some of my sample actually comes from the same location or the same location that was part of the cahokia complex and some of it even in the same time period um so we know they had a, an association during the uh woodland period and the mississippian period there was actually a lot of mounds part of the cahokia complex was actually on the western side of the Mississippi River in St. Louis as well. Mm -hmm. um, I believe St. Louis is actually called Mountain City at one time because of all the mounds part of Tokyo that were there. And then uh, since then they've kind of knocked them all down to make the city but we know that the woodland period and the Mississippian culture kind of spread all the way in the western side. So this would have been part of that. Um, not in Cahokia City proper would have been far more complex and okay. a lot more there but this would have they would have had some kind of relationship trading relationships or maybe even some kind of tribute okay. type thing going. and i noticed on the poster here you use neutron activation analysis um was that it looks like what you were doing here is you were trying to figure out the components of the different ochre in order to sort of type it and find its location is that right yeah what we'll do is we'll find the the elemental composition of the material and then we try to tie that to the landscape. So we look at the chemistry of the ochre, the archaeological sample, and match that to raw deposits, the 
composition of raw deposits mm-hmm. because they should have unique kind of chemistries, kind of self-contained. And so an ochre deposit will have a specific chemistry or relationship to iron or you know these various yeah. elements. And then if we can match what we have, the chemistry of the archaeological sample, to a specific chemistry from a raw deposit, then we can say that this ochre came from that location. Um, I wasn't able to do that with my uh, with my research here because we just don't have the reference material available to us. That we don't have the we don't have the chemistry of all of the different mm-hmm. ochres in Missouri, just because ochre is not something that a lot of people research. But what I can do is I can say that my chem- the chemistry of the archaeological sample does not match the chemistry of the sources that we do have. Okay. And so I can say it's not from those places. <laughs> I don't know where it's from because I don't have anything to match it to yet. But I can say where it's not from. And so that's at least it's at least something. Hey. Uh, so is this or is this not similar to using uh, XRF to determine chemical composition? Um, it, it's really similar. It kind of works on kind of the same principles. It's looking at the elements. Right. You know. um, NAA will be able to detect a lot more elements. Mm. XRF will typically only be able to show up 11 or 12 elements. Uh, neutron activation, I can get about 33. And so the more elements you can get, the better idea of the composition you can get. There's other methods that are can get even more elements, but it's different elements. Um, uh, a big difference is, you know, XRF, you're not going to get as many elements, and it's not destructive. And so just the way XRF works is it's reading the composition off the, the surface of the material. Or NAA is a bulk technique. So we're going to take the sample, we're going to grind it up into a powder, yeah. and we're going to get all of the chemistry instead of just the edge. And so NAA typically with something like this will work better because there's so much variation but it's it's destructive too so we have to take the sample we have to take a little tiny piece of it and destroy it to actually work on it so there's there's benefits to using xrf but it's limited in what we can actually analyze with it uh, finally uh is there or are there plans for a database uh to construct of this so other people can just match what they have to what to what you found or what other people have found yeah, we've got a uh, at my lab in Missouri. We've got a we've got a, a, a database for a lot of different materials. The oak, the ochre database is not quite as developed as some of our other databases because we just don't have as much material and people don't research it as much. But we do have a, a database that so we've got a lot of sources from around the United States and around the world, for that matter. Um, that we've got the we've got them characterized chemically and some archaeological samples in there as well that. It's it's publicly available if somebody knows how to if they contact us and they know how to get to it. But it's it's there yeah. if anybody knows how to read the read the data. So. All right. Well, thank you, Daniel Pierce from the University of Missouri. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Architect Podcast. Links to items mentioned on the show are in the show notes at www.arcpodnet.com slash Archaeotech. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com and paul at lugal.com. Support the show by becoming a member at arcpodnet.com slash members. The music is a song called Off Road and is licensed free from Apple. Thanks for listening. This show is produced and recorded by the Archaeology Podcast Network, Chris Webster and Tristan Boyle in Reno, Nevada at the Reno Collective. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com. Thanks again for listening to this episode and for supporting the Archaeology Podcast Network. If you want these shows to keep going, consider becoming a member for just $7.99 US dollars a month. That's cheaper than a venti quad eggnog latte. Go to archpodnet.com slash members for more info.